Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. We've got, uh, Tim, we've got a special guest today from Pheasants Forever, which we'll introduce here in just a minute, but we always start off our episodes with, you know, what have you, you been up to? Oh gosh, Joel, what have I been up to? Uh, well, we just finished up our podcast where we were talking about dove plots and uh, planting CRP, so this is gonna, this topic's gonna fit right in with that. Um, I've been working on some uh, wood projects. I'm working on a wood project right now for my da- oldest daughter, Emma. And I've uh, been doing deer surveys, uh, trying to see what animals made it through so that I can see, uh, again, lead to some excitement for next year. Um, that's pretty much it, really. I mean, we, we've, been, uh, we've been heavy podcasting. It, it has been heavy podcasting, uh, which is great, yep. which is great. And, you know, we're into the end of January, getting into February. So we're getting into the hard, cold months of card playing and drinking as far as it comes to winter, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, but I've been doing a little bit of the same, you know, again, been getting outdoors, doing a little prep work for next year's hunting season. Uh, took all my cameras down, except for the ones that I want to keep out there. And then uh, cut up a couple logs. Always, you know, I'm always managing trees that fall over my hunting logging roads to get to my stands and whatnot, and uh, and and put up some feeders. So I'm excited to pull pull the SD cards off those and do a little survey. And uh, you know, it's tough. You drive around and you see animals looking for food and stuff. So it's uh, it's a tough time of year. You kind of feel. You kind of feel for them, right? But uh, have you seen? Have you pulled any of your SD cards off of uh, your feeders? See what uh, animals you got coming back. Um, at at the home place, we have a feeder there and a feeder here at the cabin, and uh, we're getting a group of five does that come and hit that, and then uh, birds like crazy sure. um, in the in the morning. You know, so. Um, but I'm excited with the hunting ground here to see what we've got, especially with horns left on. Well, and your food plot still looks good. Yeah, there. I'm gonna have to put a camera out there too because they're still hitting that. Um, so it'll be interesting. I should put a camera out there today, maybe. So it's what? I mean, we're in the middle of January, and your brassica crop is still awesome. Yeah, I got a lot of brassicas out there. Of course, they're covered with snow, so they're coming in and pawing those up and eating what they can get a hold of. I went out there with the tractor and kind of plowed a couple uh areas to make it a little easier on them now that hunting season is over um so but there's a lot of there's a lot of food out there if they if they want to work for it which which they do when they are excellent yeah all right so with that let's uh introduce our guests and uh matt you want to introduce yourself real quick uh my name is matt o'connor i've been in iowa in my whole life i've left a few times but i've always come back and always uh, been working uh with uh well, I can tell you that when I was 18, all I wanted to do is get the hell out of this state and and not worry about coming back. And so I went to school up in northern Wisconsin and had a great time, shot deer in the big woods, which was what I was after. Uh, but uh, small college, I wrestled through college, and that kind of, I always said that kind of gave me where I could pay the same amount as I would have uh, gone to Iowa State and but go somewhere, somewhere else. And... Uh, Came back and worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a year. Then I worked, started working with the DNR over at the check station over at, uh, at Odessa a long time ago. And, uh, and then worked around the state in northwest Iowa and north central Iowa at Boone. And, uh, and then went to uh, the county conservation board system. I was actually hired as a naturalist, which I learned I was not. Uh, but it did help me communicate better. So in the wrong, long run, it, it was. And... Uh, uh, I'll never forget the interview question. They just bought a bunch of cross, cross country skis to start a program. And, and uh, the guy asked the question, he said, uh, so 
do you think you'd lead this cross-country ski program? I said, you, you, know, you know how to cross-country ski? And I said, well, heck, I went to school in northern Wisconsin. <laughs> Never stepped on a cross-country ski. But, but I got away with it, and he was good enough to hire me. So that's kind of got me in a full-time employment. And then uh, I went up, I was director in the Bremer County Conservation Board. And that's when Pheasants Forever was kind of getting rolling in Iowa. And uh, Jim Woolley came up and, and uh, asked me if I was interested in, in uh, maybe working for PF. And it took a while, but... Uh, uh, God, it was a great opportunity, and I was turned. I was a North Iowa regional biologist for Pheasants Forever for 16 years, I think, and then I've been working for Habitat Forever, which is a Pheasants Forever company, Habitat Forever LLC, and I manage uh, young men and women across the country, all kind of entry level jobs, but they're all doing habitat work. On we were doing this originally doing a lot on private ground, that because of just because of wet springs mm -hmm. and being able to pay our guys. Uh, it was a tough transition, but we, we moved over, and now we do most of our work uh, on public land. We contract with states for, for one reason or another, can't hire people. And so it, they hire us uh, to put people in there and, and uh, work on public lands. And we're all the way from Pennsylvania to Montana. Wow. Uh, that's been the neatest part of that job is growing up and having kind of my everything that I learned in Iowa and what goes on here. The opportunity to, to go to Oregon or go to Pennsylvania and you know Arkansas working now really need to see how other states work and you just learn a lot more because of that and it's been a great experience yeah that's awesome so how long you've been with uh, pheasants forever I, March 1st uh, will be my first uh, be my 31st year 30 for 31 yeah. years yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, wow. That's awesome. Well, before we get going any further, we have a tradition here at uh, Midwest Hunting Outdoors by Two Dumbass. So all our interviewees get a uh, merchandise. So here you thank, go. Hope thank you, you very much. Yeah. Appreciate the... Uh, but you did do the athletic cut, did you? I, it is athletic cut, just <laughs> as you requested. <laughs> so wear it with pride. But um, why don't we start uh, the episode um, in the interview with, um, you know, talking a little bit about Pheasants Forever. Uh -huh. So what... You know, if you had to put it in a paragraph or a few minutes of uh, statements, what, what does Pheasants Forever represent and what you do? What it represents for me is that what it did, especially when we first started, and we basically just gave local people the opportunity to raise the money to change for change, to be able to do something uh, for people out there in the, in, in the countryside. And... You know, that was incredible when we first started. And I'm not saying it, it wasn't by any means easy, but to see some of the different chapters and the way that they uh, reacted and, and took that money and, and built partnerships locally and, you know, started to do some, some serious work out there uh, was, was unbelievable. And, and some of that work is not just, you know, kind of back in the back 40. I always got a kick out of originally these people would put those food plots right up by the road because they were so proud of it, you know. Well, then they just knew that too many people were looking at those food plots. Now they're kind of hidden back in the in the section somewhere. But in terms of land acquisition alone, you know, in northwest Iowa, if I look at my career and say, you know, what's one of the most significant things that have happened in the last 30 years? And I'd say the, the uh, Prairie Pothole Joint Venture and the amount of land acquisition and habitat change up in the focus area in northwest Iowa. Uh, a lot of great partners, Iowa DNR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife for sure, but those chapters up there made that happen because what they did is they'd huge banquets and they'd have, you know, 800 people there that were all for it. So if any politician walked in, they, get, they got their ears full of, of positive stuff. And then just the little work of put money where it had to be. You know, there was a time up there where it was really hard to do uh, appraisals on property and for a while there the chapters were just paying the appraisals and getting them done in a faster period still good appraisals and it seems like nothing that important but it was incredibly important it allowed us to buy more land now there's plenty of times where you see in the paper and everybody gets crazy you know hundred thousand dollars raised lo locally for a piece of property you know Mahaska County's done that several times now and they do a great job with it uh, and those are great and, and a hell of a lot of work, but sometimes just helping out a little bit and being a good partner 
you know, changes. They changed, they changed the, the, the face of that landscape up there in Northeast Iowa uh, at, you know, with things that we wouldn't even believed in back in 1980 and, and changed it a lot. And so that's been good. And, and even though I, I start off with land acquisition, if you think about, or one of the neat things about our chapters that we still spend, even today, about 75% of our money on private lands. And, and so there's still a lot of money being directed towards, you know, somebody wants to put in a food plot or somebody's helping out with CRP, chapters will help them. Uh, and that ranges greatly between, you know, maybe a little bit of help for somebody who comes to them and asks at uh, where there's chapters that run a turnkey operation, working with other partners and take care of all the darn CRP stuff in the, as far as getting it planted and providing seed and all that stuff. So. It's, you know, it depends on the on the quality of people, not the quality of people, but just the time that people have and how dedicated they are towards right. it. But it's great to see an opportunity for people to do something in their local community. Yeah, they certainly do great work. I know the chapter around our area is, uh, you know, constantly uh, trying to get get more people in the chapter and you, yeah. see, you really yeah. see the habitat yeah. really starting to improve. So Matt, um, let's kind of shift gears. First of all, thanks for driving down here and coming sure. today. Um, let's kind of focus today on the episode. If I'm a landowner, which Tim and I both are, and I want to improve the habitat for upland birds, is that the right terminology? Up, upland birds? Sure. You focus sure. Well, I mean, here you're talking about both pheasants and quail. Okay, because that was going to be my next question. How do you define upland birds? So mm -hmm. we're talking pheasants and quail for the yeah, most part. Plus, plus all those all those songbirds, those neotropical migrants, grassland birds that nest in grasslands. It's all important for those folk, those two. And and remember that when I talk today, when I talk about quail and pheasant, uh, that's also impacting those birds too, because a lot of them really do key on some of the same kind of things that go on in those grassland areas. Interesting. I, my head wasn't there, but that's uh, spot on. Sure. Spot well, on. I think when you think about CRP through the ages, one of the neat things that I always remember in Howard County, uh, they had about 45,000 acres of CRP back in the early 90s. You know, it was just unbelievable. And, you know, you also start seeing um, things like uh, uh, marsh hawks and, and things like that nesting out in those areas. So you knew you had dang good grasslands and you had big enough grasslands to impact some of those other birds. Impressive. So Matt, do you, does pheasants forever then have, so I'm gonna go back to myself, be selfish here. So I'm gonna be putting in, I'm in CP25. Yeah. Does pheasants forever have any like, pheasant forever blends that they recommend? Yeah, that's what I do. Really? <laughs> yeah, I sell seed, I market for the Iowa Native Seed Growers Association. So part of my job and, it, it, and it's something that just I've stayed with because I started it back in 1993. Myself and John Ozenbaugh worked together to start a seed program. And back then, you know, it was all switchgrass or it was brome alfalfa. And, you know, we were big innovators when we set out a, a five grass mix, you know, and, and made people think about it a little more, a little more diversity out there. And uh, <laughs> it's not the greatest mix in the world. It was good back then. Um, but we've learned things that's got to be more diverse than that. And uh, we, we did a great job. And, and I tried to, be, tried to just push both landowners, but also push the people that are talking to landowners, the nature, you know, whether it was NRCS or DNR or, or Pheasants Forever, just try to push the bar to more diversity and more things out there in those fields than just a single, yeah, you know, than just switch grass. And although switchgrass is a great cover and great stuff, it, you know, what we're really talking about out there in those fields is nesting. And that's got to be the number one priority. And what are we going to do to make it attractive for nesting birds? Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let's kind of go back yeah, to yeah. if I'm a landowner yeah. and, um, you know, I want to promote habitat for upland birds, um, who can I contact or what should be my first step? I think your first step is probably NRCS office. I mean, that's where you, you need to start. Um, to see if number one, if there's any programs available to help you, but also there's people in those offices who can just start you on your way. The other thing that I would do, this is my tip, is that there's a lot of people you can talk to about doing this, but ask them for other landowners that have already gone through it. The landowners that have gone through it are going to give you the straight up of what they did. And what you got to do is get them to admit what they didn't do. 
But talking to other landowners who have gone through it is a great way to get started on this because they'll tell you where, you know, what, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they did, what they didn't do. And, and I'm going to go back to, I'll start again with the biggest tip that I can tell you. What 31 years have taught me is that good, well-meaning people who want to do the right thing start into this and they look too big meaning they do more than they can possibly get done. And so what I say to everyone is you've got to look at a five or even 10 year program and don't try to gobble it all up at one year. Everybody wants it to happen quick. That's just the way our society is. But you can really get yourself in a rut and you can get yourself down because by not getting things done, the, the management and the maintenance of that stuff can really get you down and really just, you know, it turns into... You know, you're just not getting anything done all of a sudden because everybody's got jobs. Everybody's got other things to do. You got family and yet you're trying to take on a job that, you know, damn near takes 40 hours a week just to take care of that. Start so, small and, or, and yeah, build and, on and, it. And, yeah, I don't even like saying start, start small, but if you got woodland, you know, you don't want to be doing TSI work and planting a new CRP and putting in food plots and putting in a shrub row somewhere where you think you want to have something. It just starts to build up too much. I that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, you're going to find I'm the master digressor. Uh, so I'm the one that always digresses on certain topics, and Joel's the one that keeps us on on okay. path. So just that's just my job. <laughs> Can't help it, Matt. <laughs> so uh, you said something. So is I, you said something about you know programs and talking to the NRCS. But the one thing that popped in my mind is is and this may seem counterintuitive, but are there trees that a landowner can plant that help foster upland bird? No. Okay. There There's not go. a tree that you can plant that's going to help. And I, that, that really sounds off. But, but you know what happens in Iowa is guys will go to, and I hear this all the time. Well, I go to South Dakota to go hunt pheasants. All we hunt is trees. You know, we hunt tree lines. And that's where all the pheasants are. Well, that's because that's the only thing they got. Uh, in some cases, and they like to loaf in the afternoon, so we're going to get under some. All I'm saying is, I'm going to say, get your mind off trees, because I'm going to be very, I'm going to pound trees really hard today. Okay. <laughs> but think about shrubs. It's shrubs, it's, it's autumn, I mean, American plum, you know, it's, it's nanking cherry, it's that, that kind of thing that we're looking at. Six foot to eight foot shrubs, not 20 to 30 foot trees. Nine bark? Yeah, sure. Great stuff. Any of the shrubs that they got in the at the State Forest Nursery. I'm going to go back quick to sure. other people that you need to talk to. Sure. You, know, you guys got Kevin Anderson down here in southeast Iowa. Yeah. Uh, DNR, private lands biologist. You know, great contact. Is so busy that he's, uh, those guys are great, but they're so busy that, you know, they may push you to someone else, but he's a very good source. I think you've had him on for oh, podcasts. Oh, yeah, 24 yeah. counties, I think he, he yeah. has. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. they've got some other people underneath them. But then there's also pheasants forever. You know, we have farm bill biologists now, and those farm bill biologists uh, do a great job and are focused on on doing these types of projects. You know, they do a lot of work with CRP. They do a lot of work with Equip, and and those folks are out there. And there's getting to be more of them. And the other thing is NRCS again has hired about 90 new uh, conservation techs in the state. And so those offices that seem lean there for a lot of years are starting to build back up with staff, and that staff's able to do more things. But uh, our farm bill biologists, the DNR private land specialists and biologists, uh, are, are great people to see if you've got one that's in your county. A lot of them will have five counties. They may be in your county for a short period of time, and then they go to another one. But if there's a cycle, and if you get on their list, they'll, they'll get there and help you out. So if someone... Uh you know, touches base with the DNR and the NRCS, but uh, ultimately come to you or come to Pheasants Forever. Um, what what next? I mean, what's what's the next step after that? Do you guys come and visit the property? Um, you talk through what they want to accomplish. Just kind of walk me through. Uh, well, what that there's would look some. Like. You know, I do a heck of a lot of work over the phone, just because it's all over the state. But it still amazes me the number of people that just like me to walk through the system for planting natives, you know, what do you need to do? And I just walk them through that. And I get a lot of people that say, God, just thank you. It just helps a lot here in the, here in the whole system. So, uh, 
Yeah, if you can get them out to look at the property, that's great. Uh, and you ought to be able to, someone in that, in that group ought to be able to get out there and help you. But, you know, just doing some of your own, some of your own research on it is good to, good to do. Okay. And everybody's got a secret. Everybody's got an idea. What I'll tell you is that over the years that I've been with Habitat Forever, I've been, you know, where the buck stops on I, probably about half a million acres of CRP CD. I haven't planted a half million acres, but I planted a pile of it. But uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, just hearing this, the, what you need to be aware of for not just the spring for sure, but two years past, you should be, you should be on, you know, have an idea of exactly what you're going to need to do out there. So, and this CP25 is not, I mean, uh, we build habitat for upland bird. We're also building habitat for white-tailed deer, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I talk to you guys all the time. Taller grass, bigger, thicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I actually used to have a, a white-tailed deer mix, you know, because cause you're right. You know, what we're looking at. So southern Iowa, you know, a lot of the stuff's got trees around it. Other fields do. And, you know, if it's, if it's just a big field of brome, you know, or if it's pasture, uh, those deer come out wherever they want to, you know, and what, what natives will do is they'll tend to trail those deer down and, and just because it's big and thick, instead of coming out anywhere they want, they'll tend to find a place or a few places where they like to come out. That's good for deer hunters. And then if you use any kind of food plot, you put a green browse mix out there, you know, somewhere out there, they, you know, they'll tend to head that way. So one thing that it <coughs> does positively for, a, for a deer hunter is that, it makes great habitat. The turkeys, hell, you know, our turkeys always nested in the woods. They nest in dang big prairie grass as much as anything now, or they tend to. You know, there'll be there'll be turkeys nesting out there. There's 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 pheasants that use it more so in the winter time. Not the greatest nesting cover, but if it gets diverse enough, it can be. And and then it's great. You know, deer love the dang you know big old prairie stuff. And 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 I always go uh, Bill Johnson who runs our prairie. Prairie Center up in up near Fort Dodge for the DNR always says this and I, and I try to say the same thing I'm not a botanist I just know what animals like and so that's where it's coming from for me is, is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to tell you any Latin names here for anything but I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you what I, I know <laughs> good good so let's stick with CR25 you got uh, CP25 yeah sorry so C when you sign up in the CRP you're gonna you're signing up and and if it's a general sign up or if it's even a continuous sign up, there's going to be different practices that you're signing up for. So in North Iowa, a lot of what they do is uh, CP, conservation practice, 27, 28. That's for shallow wetlands. So the 27 is where the water might stand. The 28 is the upland around those. So you probably got in under general sign up. Yep. And you're going to go under what they call rare and declining habitat. And that's CP 25. So that's a mix and it was a, you know, at the time that it came out, it was a great step for USDA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the people promoting more diversity out in those fields. And it's an excellent mix. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk it till you're tired of it here. But uh, the steps that I would say, what's most important when you're going into CP25 is taking care of that cover, what's there, whatever's there uh, in the fall before. So what are you planting into? So we planted, uh, so I had corn mm -hmm. uh, on this year, but I've since had it baled. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty much at bare ground. You're absolutely just, solid. Yep. Yeah. And what I tell people is the best medium that you can plant into is soybean stubble. You know, you just, you've, you've got some nitrogen in the ground. You've got a bare surface. It's perfect for planting natives. If you talk to the state, the state and almost all their seedings will plant soybeans for two years to kind of get rid of, of weeds, but also just get that ground in perfect shape to, to seed into. So I tell people, try to make your area look like a soybean field. So if it is in corn, the most important thing I think is to, is to cut it and bale it in the fall and get that stuff off, you're going into a soybean field. If it's brome, and this is kind of harder to do, but if it's brome or if it's old CRP that's basically turned to brome and reeds canary grass, what you want to do is you need to, you know, you need to at least cut it and hopefully cut it and bale it in the fall. Let it green up, spray it hard with, with Roundup, two quarts of Roundup, 
in the fall. If you let it come up a little bit so it's more closer to nine or 10 inches rather than you know four or five inches, you'll have some material there. And it, this is hard, they don't have to do it, but if there's a way you can get out and burn that area off with fire in March, what you end up is your soybean field. But what's gonna happen also <laughs> is that soil's gonna warm up because it's all black. You've burned off all the dang duff that's been building up there for 10 or 20 years. So you're bare ground like a soybean field. And uh, uh, when you burn it in Southern, oh, that's Southern Iowa, anywhere in Iowa where CRP's been sitting for 20 years, you see the damage in the field. I don't, as a biologist, I shouldn't call it damage, but you're gonna see all the gopher mounds, the ant hills, and everything that's happened over the last 20 years that there's nothing wrong with, with planting or build, you know, doing what you wanna do but it's just miserable to drive over. It's just, you know, you're gonna to have to deal with that when you plant, when you mow, you know, everything that happens the next two years as far as maintenance, you're gonna be bouncing over that thing, you know, smacking your head against the side of the dang cab because it's so rough. So when you burn it, you see all that and you could go out and lightly disc and just kind of clean the field. You don't, well, the good thing is you don't have to do the whole field because maybe the whole field isn't bad and you can just do where the problem sites are. All mm -hmm. right. so. We're now going back to that corn field that's been baled, I won't need to disc that though, no, right? Don't touch it. Okay. Right. Good. Every time you touch it, it's just going to cause more weeds. And so any disturbance you want to get away from, there's going to be times where you just have to. You know, there's one county up in north, northeast Iowa that's just telling their people, you you got to disc it up. But they're saying that it's just so rough up there that, you know, this is a chance. And I hate to use the word because it's, you know, it cause, it's, you know, the word's, we're going to clean it up a little bit. That's not a good habitat word in Iowa, but you hear it all the time. <laughs> but uh, but you're just going to make that field a better place to to reestablish your new planting. So you've got it. You've got it lightly disc. Everything's good. Let's say it's mid-April. Let it sit and let it green up. That might be in, in where I'm at. I use the, the date of May 10th, probably earlier down here. But let that green up. It's black. It's going to be greened up and then go in and hit it with Roundup again in the spring. And then come in and plant as soon as you want afterwards. Okay, okay. You remember that with all of our with all of our seeding now, you know, we used to say a half inch with prairie, gotta be planted shallow. I'm saying it's a quarter of an inch. And if I use the term, if, if you go back, and sometimes it's hard to see anything, but if 25% of your seed's laying on the surface, that's okay, because that means you're planting shallow enough. And so you're just, you're, all you're doing is just getting in there to get good seed to soil contact and as close to the surface as you can. That's for two reasons. One is most of the seeds that you could plant at half inch are going to come up at a quarter inch. There's not any problem with that. But some of these forbs just get smaller seed. There's not a lot of energy in those seed. They got to be able to emerge. Some of them might only emerge and move, you know, grow two inches the first year, but you got to get them out and get them started. That's the whole key with CP25 is that besides five grasses, you got to have 10 forbs in there. When I sell stuff, I usually go over the top. I'll have eight or nine grasses in that field and I'll have, I'll have 18 forbs in the mix. I just figure that more diversity is what we want, more opportunity to have more flowers. That diversity, we're going to get to it, is the most important thing when it comes to seeding. If I could, if I had the money, I, honest to God, would plant uh, 20 grasses and 80 forbs if I could get it done. Yeah, now I'm saying that coming back and looking at these fields over the years, uh, it's that forb content and it's that bunchiness and that, so it's not just all grasses growing to the sun, working hard. There's, there's bunches out there, there's clumpiness to the field. And that's what makes great nesting habitat, at least what birds you know, what birds are attracted to. Sure. And so diversity really is the key. It can be, it's a frustrating thing, uh, but uh, it's frustrating because sometimes you gotta wait a while on those forbs. You know, there's a, there's plenty of them in those mixes, even those CP25 mixes that might not show up till year four, or even year five, but they're there and they're just take a while to, to fully mature. You know, they're there and but when they flower, then you finally can go, oh, that's what that was, you know? Yeah, so let's stay with the CP25. So in addition, so you planted this mix, yep. um, and it's 
you know, starting to come up and establish. Is there anything additional? Again, just yeah. focusing on from a Pheasants Forever Upland Bird standpoint. If I had to say, I almost think that what you do next is more important than the planting. Okay. And all we've ever dwelled on, d- dwelled on is the planting. But in Iowa, because of the moisture that we get, it might be a little different story as you go west. But in Iowa, you got to mow that site the first year. I say three times. I, the, the good one that I've heard is when the weeds get up to your kneecap or just above your kneecap, mow it down to 10 inches. Now, I used to say the first time you could mow at six inches, and you probably can. But what happens is, is you start to convey that to the landowner, and then the co- landowner conveys it to the, to the uh, guy who's doing the mowing. It gets down to mow it three times, <laughs> and <Yeah>. they mow <laughs> it too short. Right. And so you've got to mow it, ten, mow it 10 inches. It's, you'd think the mowing is, you know, I, and I use it because, because it's a good catch line to use. You know, that, that sunlight is like mother's milk to a newborn. And that you need to get that sunlight down to those young plants. That's not necessarily why it's important. It's actually as important to stress those weeds. So when you cut them, they're not taking up moisture. And you're using, you're letting the prairie plants use the moisture that's available during that during that year. And I, I'll go back and talk about being old, but I we planted a lot in the late eighties, you know. Now, no one said you're no, old no, here, no, man. 80, so. 87, 88, 89 were all extremely dry years and some of the dry, driest years we've ever had uh in a long, long time. And I'd go in and dig up seed and see where it you know started, where it germinated, and the end of that root would be dried up. And I saw you know, we're never gonna get anything out of these fields. And it took longer, but three years later those fields were yeah, it's good looking prairie fields <coughs> as you can. So it's important for those plants if we do have dry years. And we just don't have that anymore in Iowa. You know, maybe maybe 2011 or 2012, whatever it was, we had a little drier year. But, you well, know, you don't think about that that much. Knock on wood, we don't, yeah. we don't want it's another been, That's one, been right? a good so. thing and a bad thing, you know, but we, we can get to that later. We usually get a good drought period down here. I mean, yeah, less. you're right. In southern Iowa, you know, after June 15th, it can cut off even yeah. before that. It's pretty dry this year for about six weeks there, yeah. um, going into late, late yeah. summer, early uh, yeah. fall. I mean, I'm not a native of this area, so I'm, I'm still learning down here. But from what I've been seeing, there's a, usually a three to six weeks stint that, Boy, you can't buy a drop of rain. Usually in Iowa, if it's CRP, you've got till July 1st to get it planted. It's earlier than that when they give you your paperwork, but usually they open it up. If it's any kind of year, they'll open it up to allow people to get everything done. And as long as we keep getting rain, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you can, the sooner you can plant, I think is the better. Okay. And and that's just once you got that early work done, get it in the ground and then be prepared to mow. So from a selfish standpoint, uh, so again, we're back to the baled cornfield. Um, would you, so I, here is what I was thinking. I was thinking, gosh, I'm not going to need to put any Roundup because I've had crops on it. I can go ahead and just plant the seed right over the top of that. Mm-hmm. Are you suggesting that, hey, I wait for it to green up and then roundup yeah because there's nothing wrong you can wait here because if you don't get that in till the end of may or first of june you're still fine you know there's not a problem there okay Uh, but just being able to take care of that first flush of weeds will make you not as nervous the first year i mean it just you just take the whole first flush out of the picture of of weeds and it slows down your mowing if 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 it works out right you know if the weather works out right sometimes you can cut down to two mowings so if it's that cost of of that spring spray, you might you might you might be able to get that back and maybe some less mowing, um, but I think if you can do it, I think it's extremely important because okay. we know that brome and, and reeds canary grass, you know whether there's a little bit of weather, dry weather, they'll shut down. They might not take up and die in the fall, um, so get them again in the spring because that's the that's the enemy out there is those cool season grasses that are going to come and take over the prairie over time. Okay. Pretty consistent message with Kevin Anderson in the last episode that we did. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, that's three good. mowings. Quit mowing <clears throat> August first, maybe the first week of August. It's going to get a little ragged looking in the fall, but I like to let that stuff get up. One thing because I know we got a bunch of hunters out there who'd like to be able to use it. Let it get tall enough so maybe you can hunt it the first year. 
but I do it because I want those plants to have a chance to grow up, build up a little bit of energy. Most of their growth is in August. And, and with our weather, hell, we get good weather, clear up till October, darn near. Let those things grow and maybe you'll see, you know, I always say, if you go out there in mid-August and you see uh, partridge pea, which is pretty identifiable, uh, looks like little, little uh, locust trees are growing up in your field. They got a yellow pea-like flower. I mean, if you, if you see a picture of one, you'll be, it's easy enough to go and identify it. Uh, there's black-eyed Susans that we put in every mix, and it's only there. It's a biannual, so it's just there to help the landowner feel like something's coming up the first year. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with them, and they'll tend to, for, to, to some degree, reseed sometimes. But they really are. They're there for you to see the first year and go, okay, something's coming up. Everything's okay. And, and then, that's a B plus. You did a great job. Uh, if you want to get an A, you'll see some, if it's in your mix, some orange globe-like flower that's actually called uh, butterfly milkweed. And if you see some of those, I tell people, there, that's an A. Yeah, you got an A. So, yeah. I never, you know, I <laughs> that's, that's what my wife would be <laughs> super happy about. In college, I, I was, dark. C's get degrees, and that's where I was at. So, so you know, that's. Yeah, you know, my wife gave on. me a C plus on my garden this last <laughs> right. year. Uh, she's tough. She's really <laughs> tough. tough. Grader. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.